Hello, church family. I hope you're enjoying the beauty of the day that God has given to us today. Yesterday was a beautiful day. The sun was out, a little breeze, and I had the privilege yesterday of going rabbit hunting, one of my favorite things to do. I did that when I was a child, and, and Brother Jimmy Henderson and, and Freeman Nix, they invited me to go with them, and, and I just had a great time yesterday being out in the sunshine. I took my day off Monday and worked, and so I could be off Tuesday and just being out there with brothers in Christ and just enjoying the dogs running the rabbit. And, and yes, I did kill one rabbit. That just proves that uh, a rabbit can have a heart attack when I shoot. I believe that's what happened. And I'm not a very good shooter, uh, but the rabbit did die, and I'm sure happy about that. And, and we just had a great day. We just had a great day. And I'm hoping you're having a great day, too, in this sunshine the Lord is allowing us to have in the midst of all the pandemic and all that's going on and not being able to be around our families as we so much would love to be. Uh, just having a day like today just adds an increased spirit inside of us. And so I hope you're just enjoying it, all right? And so uh, let me just tell you that we're looking forward to Sunday morning. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, justification on Sunday morning again. And how do I know that I've truly been justified? And so I hope you'll be here Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. And then, of course, at 10.30, the 10.30 service, uh, we're trying to get a little bit more music in our program and to try to add a few things as we start to get back to normal. It looks like that the end of March, middle of the end of March, we're going to start back our Wednesday night services and teens are going to be moved to uh, Wednesday night again. We'll still have a one on Sunday evenings. And so we're trying to get back to normal and get back to a normal pace of life. And I know that's been a little bit challenging for some of you, all the transition. And, I, and I'm so grateful that you've bore with us uh, through this, trying to know what's right, doing what's right. Uh, has not been that easy. And I'm not sure that we'll ever see the church back like we once had it, uh, but we certainly want Jesus back to where he belongs. And that's the centerpiece of our ministry, the centerpiece of our heart, and the centerpiece of our life. Uh, I heard uh, just a couple of weeks ago a young lady got saved here in our church, and I'm grateful for that. And people are still being saved and lives are still being changed. And so I'm encouraged through all of this, and I hope you'll be encouraged as well. Well, I'm going to give you a lengthy prayer list tonight, as we do on Wednesday night, just so that you'll be uh, more capable and able to pray for those. Uh, Miss Pat Barber is still taking her treatments. Please continue to pray for her. Diane Riley, Ross Grubb, next Tuesday, has open heart surgery. Please remember Brother Ross in your prayers. Jean Levesay. She just got out of Texas right before that storm hit there. And uh, uh, the cancer is still there. And we need to continue to pray for Jean. That is, that is uh, Donna Halsey's sister. And uh, just pray for her, please. Also, Brother George Kaffenberg, uh, Kaffenberger, please continue to pray for him. Uh, Brother Mike Wheely, as he's going through his treatments. Miss Norma Edwards. Uh, Lowell London, that's Pastor Scott's dad. As he's going through a difficult time. Uh, Willie Mae Oldham, uh, Brother Jim Henderson, uh, David and Sherry Fraser, Mike Spence, uh, Russ Allen, Kim Crowder, Dawn and Paul Smith. Uh, Dawn has not been feeling well. Please remember Dawn in your prayers. Uh, Miss Ruth Sykes, Case and Thompson, Miss Vera Madden, that they get some tests out on her and waiting for the results back on that. Uh, uh, Bonnie Slothauer waiting for open heart surgery uh, uh, and uh, a heart replacement, I should say. Remember Jackie Bowers, Brother Harold Lynch, Miss Irene Sparks fell and messed her leg up. And so uh, please pray for that. And I'm sure there are others that you have in your mind right now in our church family or those that are friends or relatives that are going through a very difficult time. I would hope you would pray for them. And just hold them up in prayer. Uh, there, there's some serious things going on uh, around the world and new presidency and all this transpiring with all of that. But my friend, I want you to know in the midst of all of this confusion that God is still in control. And so we're going to go to that God in prayer and we're going to ask him to do a miracle in the lives and the hearts of those uh, that uh, we have already mentioned. Also, we're men uh, I want to mention uh, Butch Trinidad. Uh, he's having some trouble with his throat. Continue to pray for him and earn his prayer. That is Pastor Scott's brother. And uh, please, please remember him and earn his prayer. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and just ask God to do uh, a miracle. Heavenly Father, I come to you. And Lord, I thank you that you're a God who hears and answers our prayers in accordance to your will. And Lord, I pray that first and foremost that your will be done. 
I pray for the sick and the afflicted, those that are having uh, uh, cancer issues. I pray, Lord, that your will be done in touching them and ministering to them and encouraging them. And Lord, I know that you are the God of all encouragement. And Lord, I know that they need your touch upon their life. And Lord, I pray uh, that you would bless Brother Ross Grubbs and be having open heart surgery next week. Lord, I pray you'd give the surgeons a steady hand and everything will go well and, and uh, he'll be well and back out doing the things he enjoys uh, and loves to do back in the summer, getting fishing again. And, and uh, so, Lord, I pray you would bless him. Lord, I pray that you will bless Bethel Baptist Church. Lord, I pray that you might open the windows of heaven and pour upon us encouragement and wisdom and discernment. Lord, if there's ever been a time the church, the church of the living God, needs to wake up and feel the presence of God. It is this time. Lord, I pray that our ears would be tentative to your voice. I pray our hearts would be sensitive to the word. I pray, Lord, that we would be faithful in our prayers and that we would, we would work as diligently as we possibly can uh, to find favor with you. And Lord, we want the favor of God in our lives. And Lord, not that we deserve that, but we want to be with you. We want to know you. We, we want to feel the heartbeat in our own heartbeat. We want, to, we want you to be glorified and honored and uplifted. We pray for our missionaries and our ministries that we support here at uh, Bethel Baptist Church. That, Lord, you would encourage and, and provide for them uh, their needs in these difficult times. And, Lord, we have a lot more safety here and a lot more precautions here than it is places around the world with this COVID. And, Lord, we thank you. Lord, for your protective hand upon us. And Lord, I pray, I pray with all of my heart, the fervor of prayer, Lord, that uh, we would see a moving, a, a revival in our churches in these last days. God, please, oh God, please pour out upon us your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray for our government, our president, our leaders, that Lord, that they may sense and understand the era of their way. And the way that they are going is the way of the transgressor. And Lord, I pray their hearts would be open to the truth. And Lord, they would follow the truth and the, then the leadership of men. So Lord, I pray that you will just provide and minister in incredible ways because we love you with all of our heart. Your will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to tell you that prayer is important and I hope that you will continue to pray in this season of change. Well, we've been talking about on uh, Wednesday night We've been talking about on communication, the subject of communication. And we started out with number one is that we learn how to be honest in our relationship and communication. That we learn how to uh, uh, communicate in such a way that we're not fabricating stories or we're not twisting the story or we're not telling half truths or just full out lies. That we are learning to speak the truth in love. And we're going to speak that truth and love and be honest so the person that I'm communicating with ultimately trusts me when I talk to them, when I tell them the truth. They understand that it is the truth and they don't have a doubt about my communication with them. We've talked about keeping current in our communication. And one of the real struggles in a marital relationship in particular is letting the past be the past. That we're constantly bringing up the past in order to prove a point in the present. And we have to work at that. We really have to work at keeping current. And what God has forgiven, what God has cleansed us from, we have to know that that no longer has control of our lives. That God has forgiven us. Therefore, if somebody asks us to forgive them, we grant forgiveness there and we don't bring that up anymore. We move forward. You see, forgiveness is not forgetting. It's the willingness to say, I let it go. I'm just going to let that go. Because Satan's going to bring something that's happened in your life from somebody else. They're going to bring it back. And what you're going to have to say to that, you know what, Lord? I've forgiven them for that. I've forgiven them and I'm going to move forward. I understand you want to hold that against me so, so that I can keep that current in my life so that, so, that I, so that I'm out of control ultimately as it relates to the other person. So therefore, I just want to keep current. That's a great, great truth. Do I have the facts right? Uh, should love hide this situation? Is my attitude right? All of those things are so critical and so vital in understanding what it means to keep current. Now, last week, 
unfortunately, the video didn't turn out like we wanted, and there were some sound difficulties, and you couldn't have heard the sound. And so uh, we talked about attacking the problem, uh, not the person. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight in review. Uh, you didn't get to hear it last week. You're going to get to hear it tonight. In verse 30, the Bible says of Ephesians 4, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now that's a very critical passage of Scripture in the Bible. Because you're never going to be really happy in your life. You're never going to have the fullness of God in your life if you're constantly grieving the Spirit of God. So he said, grieve not the Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed. We're sealed with the Spirit of God. So the moment that we're saved, the Holy Spirit takes up rest in our life, forever settled that He's in our heart, in our being, until the day of redemption. The word redemption is the paying of a price to set one free. Because He has set us free, He has delivered us, we got to learn how to attack the problem and not the person. Now I'm going to be totally transparent with you this evening. This is the hardest one. Of all the four laws of communication, this is number one. Because what is very difficult to do is to separate that person from that sin. Because when we look at that person who's been committing sin and, and uh, they are living in sin, what ends up happening, we start attacking them. And we just unleash the fury and the wrath of our being upon them when in reality we need to start attacking the problem that exists in their life. You see, we have to put on the words that don't tear down. Uh, there are words that seem to be permanent words like uh, always and never, you're an idiot, you're dumb, I hate you. Uh, I mean, we say these words and we're attacking the person and not the problem. And I could give you a couple of illustrations and I think I will because it adds value and virtue to what I want to say. A number of years ago, I had a young man come into my office and he had a drug problem. Started out with uh, beer, and then it went to marijuana, and then it went to uh, cocaine. And so his family didn't know how to deal with him. And so they just stayed on him all the time and told him how sorry he was, how worthless he was, how no good he was. And he already felt all those things, trust me. He already felt all of those things. And so this family really struggled with dealing with the problem without attacking the person. Now in some way, there is a connection, all right? Let's not, let's not dismiss that. There is a connection in some way because by your will and by your desire, you are committing this. So we have to find a way to attack the problem that is destroying the person because that's what's destroying the person is the problem this person has. So they bought into, say, drinking first, then some marijuana, and then some cocaine, and, and, and some other things went along with that, and partying, and, and sometimes shooting up heroin. And, uh, and so the family had to come in, and they're, they're ready to disown their son. They're ready to destroy him and tell him to never come back. And, and, uh, and, I, and we had a long conversation about what has created this problem. What do you think created this problem? And the more we got into conversation, they began to realize there were some things that went on in his life that they overlooked, that they just ignored. Things that could have encouraged him and blessed him and ministered to him, they found criticism in him all the time. Everything this young man attempted to do, he felt like a failure. So when he had a drink in him, he felt better about himself. He just felt better about himself. There was a comfort zone. There was a, there was a sense that everything's okay. And then the next thing you know, that wasn't enough. And then, he, and then he was around his buddies, and his buddies, they were laughing and having fun, and that's what he wanted. He didn't want to feel lousy. He didn't want to feel put down all the time. He didn't want to feel like nobody loved him, nobody cared about it. So then he got into some marijuana. That made him feel any better, even better. And then it got to even stronger because that wasn't enough. And ultimately, he's destroying himself. And he's destroying his family as well. So we had to come to some kind of uh, uh, understanding that we had to learn how to attack the problem. He needs to go to some rehab. He's got to get away from this. We've got, we got to detach that from him. Well, they did that. And I want to give you the good news that this young man uh, is no longer doing drugs, or at least the last time I heard from him, he was doing terrific. And uh, because they learned how to attack the real problem in his life. Now, another one was a young lady. A young lady 
who uh, was very, very, uh, let, let me just say, she didn't want to be around people very much. She was very, very uh, self-centered in some ways and didn't like to be around people. And so she just closed herself off. She was an introvert. That's the word I'm looking for. She was an introvert. And so when people came around, very attractive young girl, uh, she really, really, really struggled with being around people. She just didn't feel comfortable. Well, when I visited her in the hospital, she had tried to slit her wrist, all right, and to kill herself. And I went in, they gave me permission, gave me the code. I go in, I visit with this young lady. And, uh, and we begin to talk about what's really going on in her life. What's really happening in your life? I mean, you're beautiful, you're smart, you're academically gifted, and yet you don't want to go out, you want to stay at home. And, and uh, so the more that we dug into her past, she began to reveal some things that was very disturbing that was dominating her present. So what had ended up happening, she attacked her own self. Now, I want you to listen to me. She was attacking her own self because she blamed her own self for what had happened to her. It was her fault. Well, the reality was her uncle had sexual activity with her when she was 12. And, uh, and she thought that was her fault. He told her that she was flirtatious. He told her all of these words. And so she attacked herself and the more that she attacked herself, she lost all value and worth. So she attacked herself. I see that all the time. I see people that attack themselves and tell themselves they have no value, no worth, and no meaning. So you attack yourself. You're not attacking the problem. In reality, what you're doing is saying, I'm not very valuable. I'm not very important. Nobody really loves me. Nobody really cares about me. You know what? I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go through life with no meaning and purpose. Well, that's a lie from the devil. I just want you to know that is a lie from the devil. When I'm attacking the problem, what I'm doing is I'm getting to the core of the problem. That way, I can begin to have value and worth and meaning to my life. Now, you may be watching me tonight by by the uh, uh, telephone or on the computer or on the television. And what I want to tell you is this. Jesus loves you. No one could ever love you more than Jesus. So if you're walking around grieving the Holy Spirit of God of saying, I have no value, I have no worth, I am a nobody, I'm telling you that Satan has you right where he wants you. So let's attack the problem. And the problem is this. You are valuable. You are valuable to God. You have worth and meaning and purpose that God has for you. And I want you to use that in your life. I want you to rise up with the help of God and say, Devil, you've lied to me long enough. I don't think I'm very important. I don't think I'm very good. I don't think I've got very much meaning. And through the years, people told me. They just attacked me and attacked me and put me down and criticized me and tell lies about me. And people have said those things. And I feel terrible about myself. And so therefore, I just want to isolate myself from everybody. Reality is, God loves you. If God loves you, that's all that really matters. Because He's a God of forgiveness and of hope and for a future for your life. And I want you tonight, before you go to bed, if that's you, if that's where you are, or you have a granddaughter or grandson or somebody that's going through their life, what I want you to do tonight, I want you to pray for them, that they find value and worth and stop attacking them, attack the problem that has across this person to feel their value and worth. And so listen to me, my friend. Jesus really does love you. Jesus really does care. He proved that by giving his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. I want you to wake up in the morning with a whole new life, with a whole new meaning and a whole new purpose, that you have value to our Heavenly Father. And He has a design for you to fulfill that purpose. May God bless you and may God strengthen you as you serve Him in Jesus' name. Amen.